Hi, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight uh, to our second presentation from Storm Surge to help uh, educate us in our community about the uh, effects and implications of climate change and sea level rise. And just out of curiosity, I want to see a show of hands if this is your first uh, lecture that you've attended or attended. All right, so maybe 25% uh, of these people are new. Um, so our last event was held at the Newburyport Public Library. All of our future events through the uh, into the Christmas season will be held here at the National uh, Wildlife Refuge. And uh, the reason Storm Surge has formed is because uh, we're a group of concerned citizens, and many of us are scientists and educators and project managers. And we're concerned about uh, what's happening in our world around us and feel as though our communities need to start paying attention to what's going on so that uh, we can adapt and make the changes necessary to accommodate the, uh, what lies ahead of us. So part of that process is uh, one of social change, which uh, takes a long time. And uh, we feel as though we need to educate the populace, stimulate a need um, in the populace to maybe put a little bit of pressure on their elected officials to start paying attention to this. And so we start with the uh, these educational seminars and, and lectures. So tonight, we have uh, Dr. Cameron Wick, who will be lecturing um, on uh, climate change here in New England. We'll be looking at what's happened in the past, what's going on now, and what kind of changes we'll see in the future. And uh, he's well qualified to talk about this. He's a research associate professor, professor in climatology at the uh, University of New Hampshire. And um, he's published some 70 papers uh, in peer-reviewed journals on that subject and, and others. And I don't want to delay it any longer, but I'd like to introduce him and welcome him. And uh, let's see what we can find out. Uh, well, really happy to be here with you this evening, and, and thanks for inviting me down. Um, Hopefully it won't be too much lecture, a little bit of information, and then we'll leave plenty of time uh, for you guys to answer questions. Uh, and, uh, so I won't talk for too long, but I'll, I'll talk for uh, a while. Uh, before I dive in, actually, I really want to tell you the three things that you should know about climate change that I've come to understand after 25 years of studying it. Uh, and I'll show you all the slides and the data and stuff, but here's the main points. The first one is climate change. Climate always has changed, and climate always will change. The only difference today is that humans are the main drivers of that change. And I can say that because there's an overwhelming body of scientific evidence that shows that that's the case. Um, as a result, uh, our future climate is literally in our hands. The climate that our children and grandchildren inherit depends fundamentally on the, the, the decisions we make today and over the ne next decade on how we produce energy, on how we use energy, and how we adapt to the new climate normal. Uh, so th that's an important point, right? The future climate is literally in our hands. Um, most of you are my age or older in the audience, and uh, we're going to be okay. <laughs> it's our kids and grandkids that are really going to suffer as a result of what's happening right now. Um, Second is, over 25 years, that climate change has become a distinctly moral issue for me. Uh, and uh, I think of that in, in a couple of different ways. One is that it's the most vulnerable who are going to suffer the most. It is the old, the young, uh, the weak, the sick, and the poor uh, that are going to suffer the most. And uh, for proof of that, you just have to look at the big disasters we've had in Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. And if you had resources, you were able to get out of town. If you were stuck in a hospital bed, you weren't. Um, it's also uh, true that I drove down here, uh, in, I'll, I'll be in a fuel efficient car, but I emitted a bunch of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It's going to be around for well over 100 years. It's going to be heating our planet for a long time. So I get all the benefit out of burning that energy, and I put the impact on the children and the grandchildren. Um, last but not least, uh, the third point is that it's really not about the economy versus the environment, which is often at, at how this problem is set up, and especially in New England, 
It's about the economy and the environment. We really have to work to replace the tyranny of the or for the opportunity of the and. And again, uh, there's two ways I think about that. One is the weather disasters that were that are hitting us with Hurricane Sandy sort of topping, right? $65 billion. It's a lot of money. We've got to figure out how we can make our communities more resilient so that we save people's lives, we protect their quality of life, but so that we can rebound after the weather disasters that we're seeing. And that ultimately, if we invest up front, that's going to save us money in the long run. The other way to think about that is our energy security. The only way we can control how much we spend on energy is by controlling how much energy we use and where that energy is generated. So we should become more efficient and use less, and then we should generate all that energy in New England. And if we wanted to, we could actually do it. We have the technical capabilities to solve that problem. I've done the calculations more than once. We have plenty of renewables that we could harness to actually drive our entire economy and make us very comfortable. We just have to want to do it. Is it going to cost money? It's going to require a huge investment. And we have to figure out how we can get that money out of private markets and in helping our communities and make sure we can get a rate of return on that. Uh, but that's really the challenge before us. How do we improve our energy security? And how do we make our communities more resilient to the new climate normal? And uh, I think if we actually go down that pathway, it would be really good for our New England economy because you cannot ship those jobs overseas. And we'd have pretty much, I would argue, pretty much full employment if we invested in that. All right, so you can go home now. That's my, my three main points, but now I'll go through all the, all the details. Uh, just a, a couple, one, one slide to start. Uh, I, I'm actually by training, I'm an ice core paleoclimatologist, and I got to spend this past spring up on Denali. So this is like the picture of me with the beard filled with ice, snow and ice. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is our drill site up in, uh, up, up in Denali National Park. There's Mount Forker here. It's Mount Hunter right here. And down here in the distance you can see our drill site. We did a little bit of skiing, uh, but we actually drilled uh, two cores to bedrock in, in the month of May. Uh, flew them out by helicopter, then by airplane, then by freezer truck, and then a federal facility in Denver now. We just cut them up and we're going to reconstruct climate change in central Alaska for the last thousand years where it hasn't been reconstructed. And that's the, that's the best site for any ice core scientist. That's the last piece of core from the bottom of the hole where it goes from the clear ice at the top to the dirty ice right next to the bed. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about Alaskan climate change. I'm going to talk about climate change in New England. But I just want to provide a couple of uh, introductory slides on where you can get really good climate information. Uh, this site is back up now that our government is back up and running. It's called climate.gov. It's really easy to remember. It's got lots of stories. It's a nice website. 16 different federal agencies contribute to it. But I really like it because it has all the data. Uh, and so you can go in and you can actually look at how temperatures change or how solar energy has changed or how sea levels rise or how snow cover is changing or how carbon dioxide levels are changing. So uh, for your denier friends, if you want to get involved in an argument, you can probably do that. It's not too hard. But if you actually want to get involved in a discussion, you can start off by saying, hey, let's look at the data. All of the discussions I have with people tend to start, let's just talk with the data and see if we can agree on that. Because if you can't agree on the data and the science, it's impossible to have a discussion about how to move forward, in, in, in my humble opinion. So this is a, a great site if you don't want to sort of follow all the scientific literature. This is another uh, very powerful uh, data point. Uh, every four years, the Pentagon produces a quadrennial defense review for incoming Congress. The next one's coming out in 2014. And in their last 80-page report, they, they dedicated eight pages to the issue of climate change. And that quote, which I'll give you a second to read, sums up uh, what they said in eight pages in that report. You cannot separate our future security from the issue of climate change, and you can't separate our security from our economic activity, right? They're intricately linked. This is not a liberal think tank, right? This is the organization that's responsible for uh, ensuring our security into the future, and they're beginning to act, and I'd like to see sort of that as a signal for the rest of our society to actually stop talking. We gotta talk about this, but we actually have to start figuring out what it is we're gonna do for the future. I'm going to have one piece of ice core information uh, for you. I just want to set the stage. This is a really famous ice core record that comes from a place called Vostok in Antarctica. Uh, that upper picture in the left-hand corner is actually a picture of the Vostok ice core coming out of a barrel. 
And that one below it, that's kind of kaleidoscope of colors, is actually a thin section of an ice core viewed through cross polars. These hexagonal crystals here are the ice crystals. And these big blobs are actually samples of air that are trapped in the ice as the snow transforms to ice. So when we drill an ice core and we go back in time, we pull it out, we actually can capture samples of the atmosphere that have been trapped in the ice core lattice. We crush that ice, we suck that air out, and we can measure the trace gas content back 420,000 years ago. That's pretty cool. That's like a cool scientific experiment. Mm -hmm. So we've been able actually to track the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere for about 420,000 years. And there's something, hopefully you see this four, this sort of 100,000 year cycle here, right? Current interglacial, glass glacial here, 18,000 years ago, right? There was nothing living in Newburyport or Plum Island 18,000 years ago. You, we're covered by a mile of ice here. Right? Sea level was 400 feet low. It was a very different environment. Last, the glacial lasted about 90,000 years, and there was a previous interglacial. You can see that 100,000 year cycle of glacial interglacial cycles, driven primarily by changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, that changed the amount of radiation that the Northern Hemisphere received. That drove, the, drove this vicious cycle of, I call it an ice albedo feedback loop, which you can ask me about if you want. The, the, the real important point I want to show you is carbon dioxide has never been higher than 300 parts per million by volume and never lower than 180 parts per million by volume, making the Earth a pretty nice place to live. So thank the ecosystem when you go outside for keeping carbon dioxide between these levels. Right? So along come human beings and we figure out that we can burn carbon from the crust. That gives us all the energy uh, that we've actually used over the course of the last 150 years to do incredible things. Uh, but there's this byproduct called carbon dioxide. So that blue line represents uh, the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since we started monitoring it directly in 1957 in Hawaii uh, by a scientist called Charles Keeling, who figured out how to convince his PhD advisor to send him to Hawaii to do his <laughs> PhD research. Um, so you can see that we have already increased the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere an amount that's similar to the transition that we see between the glacial and interglacial age. All right? I have to show you no other piece of evidence to tell you that humans are dramatically changing the Earth's climate system. Right? There is no doubt. Why do you care about carbon dioxide? Because it's just like a blanket that you put on your bed on a cold East Coast winter night. It's not like a greenhouse. It's like a blanket. That blanket uh, helps trap long-wave radiation coming from your body. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap long wave radiation coming from the Earth. We figured out the physics 50 years ago, you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's going to get warmer. Basic physics. So when I first came to New England, I actually uh, learned an interesting Yankee saying that, that usually parents use for their kids, it was something like, if you're not careful, son, daughter, uh, you're going you're to end up where you're going. And that's exactly what's going to happen with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. If we continue to rely upon fossil fuel as our main source of energy, by the end of this century, we're going to end up with carbon dioxide levels at something on the order of 1,000 parts per million by, by volume. That's going to result in catastrophic climate change. Conversely, if we invest in energy efficiency and renewable technologies and exporting our American can-do spirit around the world, which we're not doing right now when it comes to energy efficiency and renewable technologies, we could uh, level out by the end of the century somewhere at 400 to 450 parts per million. That's certainly going to result in some climate change, but likely climate change that we can deal with and adapt to. So that's where we're going, that's where we need to be, and the difference is the challenge that our kids and grandkids face. Just a couple of other global pieces before we uh, dive into uh, climate change in New England. Uh, this is a record that has really taken uh, the scientific world uh, by storm. Uh, and if you've been paying any attention, you've probably heard about it in the newspaper as well. So this is the amount of September Arctic sea ice extent uh, from 1979 to 2011. So this is uh, the satellite record of sea ice extent. So you can see uh, the y-axis, the vertical axis on the left-hand side is a million of square kilometers. And you can see that the, the blue line tracks this long-term decline in the amount of sea ice that's around at the end of the summer. So why do you care about Arctic sea ice? Because it's white. And it reflects incoming solar radiation. It's a really important component of the Earth's energy balance. When you remove that sea ice, what's left is dark ocean 
that absorbs most of that incoming solar radiation and it heats up a lot, making it really difficult for the sea ice to form in the winter. So we've seen this long-term decrease in the aerial extent. It's also getting quite a bit thinner. There's not as much multi-year sea ice. But then we had this crazy year back in 2007 when we lost a lot of the multi-year sea ice. So there was one year thick sea ice, which is 10 to 20 feet thick. And we had a really warm summer. And we had a loss, a decrease of 25% of sea ice at the end of the summer in that one year. And then it happened again in 2012. And it's rebounded a little bit this year. But uh, we're essentially going to see the, the, the loss of uh, Arctic sea ice sometimes in the next, sometime in the next decade or two, maybe three. And that's not coming back because the Arctic Ocean is heating up. So we've sort of crossed that tipping point. It's going to disappear, and we have to deal with it. If you, uh, uh, if you actually talk to your, your denialist friends, they'll say, well, it rebounded in 2012. Let's not worry about it. But that's because 2012 was a cool year. So there's always going to be year-to-year -year variability, but we're in a long term. Um, the, the other thing that my denialists can read on the web is that, well, don't worry about it, it's going to come back in February. It's like, we don't really care about Arctic sea ice in February because there's no sun in the Arctic in February. It's not really affecting the Earth's energy balance that much. Um, and then in case you've heard about, uh, read some newspapers about the global warming pause, like it's not warming up anymore, uh, well, here's a decadal average of temperatures going up through 2010, and you can see that we continue to warm. Uh, what's happened over the last four to five years is that more of that energy is in fact going into the ocean. So that red line uh, represents the world ocean heat content from zero to 2,000 meters, and the black line is even the deeper ocean, right, 700 to 2,000 meters, and you can see that those temperatures are just continuing to go up. Now, this is measuring the heat content because the ocean contains, and it's a huge flywheel, right? It's a huge thermal mass, so it doesn't go up a lot in temperature, but small temperature you know, uh, relates to a huge heat content. So let me just put that into context for you. Where is global warming going? Right? Almost 94% into the ocean. So we see little blips in atmospheric temperature, but it's really the ocean temperature that we want to we want to pay attention to, and look at how the ocean is heating up, right? Continuing to heat up in a significant way. Um, so that's where the uh, warm is going. So uh, let's turn to New England. I guess the real question I'd like you to consider is, were you ready for the storm? And there's not any one particular storm I want to point to. It's any number of storms, and you can add the ones that I don't have up here. But uh, this is one, uh, uh, Snowtober, right? About two years ago, when we got a foot of snow right before Halloween. Uh, when the oak leaves were still on the trees, and uh, the utilities uh, right, got hammered by the regulators because they weren't ready for a storm that dropped a foot of snow at the end of October. So when have we ever had that before? Right? Hasn't happened. We weren't ready for it. Uh, we had big flooding in 05, 06, and 07 from springtime storms. One of the pictures up there from Newmarket, New Hampshire, that got really badly flooded. We had Irene, uh, uh, which obviously did considerable damage uh, across Vermont, and then uh, Sandy down there in the right-hand corner. So this is very much the new climate normal that we need to be prepared for. And uh, I'm going to ask you the question again, right? are we prepared? I would say that we're not. Um, what we're really prepared for, what we're really good at in New England, is getting rid of snow from the races. So if you don't believe me, go to Washington sometime and there's a big snowstorm. And they, they can't figure it out when there's four inches of snow on the ground. They can't plow it. They don't know where to put it. There's taxis stuck in the street. Nobody wears boots. It's like, what's wrong with you people? In New England, we figure that out into our municipal budgets, our county budgets, our state budgets. We, we bring in salt all summer and sand. We are prepared for nor'easters and storms. And that's what we need to start doing for climate change. It needs to be a decision that we make in our family budgets, in our community budgets, in our municipal budgets, in our county budgets and in our state budgets to deal uh, with, uh, with the changes that's going to happen. And not just deal with it in the aftermath, but actually prepare for it so the impact is much less. That's probably my main message for tonight. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Northeast. I'm not going to show you all my data because it would take weeks. I'm just going to show you a few highlights. This is by far the most dramatic change that we've seen in any single indicator that we look at across the Northeast. And it's an increase in northeast winter temperatures uh, across the entire region. So the blue line represents year-to-year -year temperature variability, and the red line represents the long-term, century-long trend 
and then the trend over the last five decades. So what you can see is there's a long-term warming, but really the rate of that warming has doubled over the course of the past five decades. You can also see if you don't, if you don't like a winter, right, wait, because the fall and winter is going to be way different, right? And we know that in New England. Our, our, our weather varies year to year considerably, but long-term significant warming and a really increase in the rate of change. So if I take that linear trend over the last 50 years and I plot it as a dot on this map, there's the trends from all the stations that make up that previous plot. But you can see that we're looking at an increase of three to four to greater, three to four degrees Fahrenheit or greater temperature increase over the last five decades, right? This is not climate change in the future. This is what's already happened. And it's clearly related to our, 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 the dynamics of snow cover. So you get a little bit of warming, you get a little bit less snow cover, that snow changes from white snow to brown ground, and that brown ground absorbs more incoming solar radiation and heats up and melts more snow. So this, a, this is a very particular mid-latitude signal that we're experiencing, and our winters are warming up as a result. Uh, there's also, I, I love to play, I love to ski, I love to drill ice core, and I love to play pond hockey. Um, uh, I love living in New England as a result, and so, uh, I'm really concerned about the loss of all the ice that we have on our ponds and our lakes. Here's two really long-term records from Lake Winnipesaukee uh, on top and uh, Lake Sunapee on the bottom. Um, uh, and you can see since about 1970, this is the, these are the, uh, that says on top, you can't see it, ice out dates. So when the ice actually leaves. And you can see that, it, that it's uh, happening earlier and earlier over the course of the last 40 to 50 years. Uh, when I was up at the Pond Hockey Classic, here's my... My team here, that's up on Lakewood and Pisaki. Uh, last year was great, but the year before, on February 1st, the ice had not come in on Lakewood and Pisaki and Meredith Bay, so we had to move the entire tournament. This isn't a small tournament, this is 1,500 people playing pond hockey for a weekend, uh, and they had to move it off to another lake. So uh, I'm sure if you've been paying attention, you've, you've seen that the ponds around here don't freeze uh, like they used to. Uh, so another indicator is uh, changes in extreme precipitation event. Uh, Durham, New Hampshire is where the University of New Hampshire is. Uh, what I've got plotted here is uh, four inch precipitation events that occur in a four hour period. So these are really big rain events. Uh, uh, on the bottom I've plotted number of events per decade. So 1948 to 57, 58 to 67 and so on. And what you see is that the number of events essentially has doubled over the course of the last decade. I first saw this, I said, I can't believe it. Somebody's been messing around with the Durham Met record. They haven't been paying attention. But Lawrence, Massachusetts, it's exactly the same. Right? It's the same here in Newberry. But you guys just don't have a Met station. Right? You're getting way more rain and fewer events. And that rain is falling on a watershed that's got more impervious surface because we've developed it in a big way over the course of the last five decades. So you're getting bigger floods because there's more rain and more of that rain is running off into the river resulting in more flooding. Um, another way to look at how climate change has affected the region is to look at what the New England states have actually asked for from um, uh, the federal government in terms of presidentially declared disasters and emergency declarations. And so, uh, you know, I've got different colors for different states, but you can begin to see a real change here with the flooding events that we had in 2005, and Massachusetts suffered quite a bit in this. New Hampshire in green, 05, 06, 07. Big flooding events. Irene in 2011, you can see Vermont over $200 uh, million. Uh, but this isn't solely a result of climate change. This is climate change interacting with communities that have made themselves vulnerable to that changing climate. We have not been building our infrastructure so our communities are resilient. We've been ignoring it. And as a result, we're seeing more and more damage as our storms are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so that's going to be a key indicator to track as we go forward in the future. Uh, I would also add that this pales in comparison to what happened with Superstorm Sandy, right? $65 billion versus we're talking at the most, right, $500 million. Uh, let's not hope something like Superstorm Sandy hits our coastal New England. It's bound to come uh, eventually. Our 1938 storm is around the corner somewhere, just with a lot more sea level rise. Uh, here's how sea level has been changing. Portland, Maine, Boston, and New York going back to 1850. You can see that there's this steady rise, about 7 to 8 inches over the course of the last 100 years. Boston and New York are particularly vulnerable because the land is actually have coastal subsidence. 
while uh, uh, the volume of the ocean is increasing, we're a little bit better sort of here going north, but you guys uh, are certainly well aware of what's happening out on Plum Island in the houses there as a result of sea level rise and big storms. All right, so that's, we've already seen considerable climate change. So I want to spend the rest of my remarks talking about how climate might change in the future. And this comes from a number of different studies. Uh, one of them is uh, the Northeast Climate Impacts Assessment from back in 2006, 2007. And you can get all the results I'm going to show you at climatechoices.org. And then more recently, I've been working with a group of really good scientists uh, to develop a number of different regional or watershed-based regional climate assessments. So we've done one for Casco Bay. We've done one for Great Bay. I'm finishing up two uh, for New Hampshire. And over the course of the next year or two, we want to go back and revisit and do it actually for watersheds across New England. So uh, stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, I started off by saying uh, uh, the future climate is literally in our hands. And so this is a graph that sort of uh, shows you that. We can't possibly predict what our economy is going to look like next year, next decade, let alone 90 years from now. So uh, we're not foolish enough to try. Instead, what uh, climate science and climate scientists have done is really develop a set of uh, plausible scenarios. Think about them as storylines, things that could happen, not necessarily things that will happen. And it's a way for us to actually begin to think about the problem when dealing with significant uncertainty of not knowing what our economy is going to be like. So this was done by the Intergovernmental Panel starting in 2001 and they did it in 2007 and the re recent report that just came out. Uh, but what they've said is, let's look at a bunch of different scenarios. And I'm just plotting two of the many scenarios that have been developed. One is the high emission scenario, that's in red. So what you're seeing here is numbers that represent carbon emissions associated with uh, a population, socioeconomic, and energy future storyline that they've developed. Uh, population grows to 9 billion people by the middle of the century, which it almost certainly will. Uh, we behave a little differently in the developed world in that we actually spend a lot of money to bring the developing world out of poverty, but a lot of that elevation out of poverty comes with them burning fossil fuel. So greenhouse gas emissions take off because the developing world is burning a whole bunch more energy, even as we're becoming more energy efficient. The low emission scenario, and you can see this is global carbon CO2 emissions, billion metric tons a year on the bottom. Uh, the low emission scenario, same population socioeconomic scenario, the only difference is we get our energy through first energy efficiency, so we cut uh, our demand for energy by about 50%, and then we produce that uh, with renewable sources. And you can see that uh, our greenhouse gas emissions begin to drop by the middle of the century and then go down. Concentrations in the atmosphere continue to rise because carbon dioxide has a lifetime of more than 100 years in the atmosphere. So then we take those numbers and we use those as drivers for these tools science has called global circulation models or general circulation models or general climate models, depending on who you listen to. And so we can look at what the outcome of the two different uh, emissions of carbon dioxide are based on temperature and precipitation with these models that actually essentially reconstruct how the Earth's climate system works. What we do is we take the output from these big global climate models and we statistically downscaling it using historical data to develop a relationship between a big grid cell and a whole set of meteorological stations on the ground. So we do that so that we can better understand sort of smaller scale uh, changes. And if you want to know more about that, we can get into the technical details. But it does a pretty good job at reconstructing climate over the, the training period. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how our temperature and precipitation might change in the future. So here's temperature uh, going from right 1900 up to 2100. The black line is the historical record. Uh, the, the, the red line represents the higher emissions scenario uh, temperatures and the orange line the lower emissions scenarios. Three things from this. One is the models actually capture the warming we've seen over the last four to five decades. That's good. Global climate models are capturing what's going on in the Northeast. The second big point, by 2050 or 2040, there's no difference between the two curves. What does that tell you? It is unlikely that, sorry, I would say it is very likely that our temperature is going to go up by an additional 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no difference between the emission scenarios. 
And that's happening for two reasons. There's incredible inertia in the climate system, and that carbon dioxide lasts for a long time in the atmosphere. So you can't solve the problem in a short period of time. So that is an amount of warming that we are already committed to, and we better start preparing for, or it's going to cost us a lot more money to it, even if we prepare for it. Last but not least, you'll see by the end of the century that there's actually very different amounts of warming. And that happens if globally we can transition our energy system over the next decade. And the reason it has to happen over the next decade is that once you begin the transition, it's going to take 30 to 40 years to transition that energy system, which also is like a proverbial super tank and it takes forever to turn around. You can't just stop producing energy with fossil fuel and do it all with solar. It's going to take incredible investment, lots of hard work, but we've got to start today so that by the end of the century we have warming that we can adapt to as opposed to warming that's catastrophic. So what does that, uh, what does that really mean in terms of temperatures? So we tried to put this in, a, in what we call our migrating state map. So there's Massachusetts up there, 1961, 1990, summertime temperatures. How hot will Massachusetts feel in the future? Well, under the high emission scenario by the end of the century, Massachusetts summers will feel like they currently do in South Carolina. Conversely, if we follow a low emission scenario, Massachusetts summers are still going to feel like they do in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Uh, let me put that into perhaps a more stark contrast for you. Currently, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, you guys are probably a little cooler here than you, they are in Boston. They currently experience 9 to 10 days per year that feel as though they're above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Those are the really uncomfortable days, usually that have bad air quality associated with them when we're all running our air conditions. Uh, and I know that because the biggest energy demand in New England is now in summertime because of us running all our air conditions. By the end of the summer, under the high emission scenario, we would expect there to be 65 days per summer that were hotter than 9 degrees Fahrenheit, which means summers would be a heat wave, right? Two thirds of the summer would be above 90 degrees, punctuated by slightly less uncomfortable days. Conversely, under a low emission scenario, we're still looking at 30 days per year that are above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to get hotter. We're going to have a lot, probably a lot more premature mortality as a result of heat stress. Probably something we need to start planning for and preparing for. Projected changes in extreme precipitation. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to just multiply these numbers by 10. I couldn't find my other graph when I put this together. But just think of that as 2, 4, 6, number of events per decade. So you can see for all the stations I have here, right? Concord, New Hampshire, Durham, New Hampshire, Lawrence, Mass, Portland, Maine. You just put Newburyport in there. We're looking at a significant increase in the number of these events from what have happened in the past, sort of two to three to four per decade, to essentially 10 to 12 to 14 per decade. Right? We're gonna have more big precipitation events in the future. And that rain is gonna fall on watersheds that have more pavement in them and likely more impervious surface unless we develop our watersheds differently, which we can and we technically know how to do. We just have to do it. But if we continue on business as usual, the floods are going to get ever bigger and bigger. Um, and any, you know, we look, we look at output from a whole bunch of different models and really they all say the same thing. More rain and fewer events. And the reason is because warm air can hold more moisture. So when we do have precipitation events, there's more moisture in the air uh, that can come down. Actually, I want to share a, 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 a one research project I was working on in the Lamprey River, where we actually mapped not only how the hundred-year flood chains, uh, the hundred-year floodplains have changed in the historical period up to till today, but how they might change in the future. So this is we looked at the Lamprey uh, River watershed, which uh, drains into Great Bay. It's in southeastern New Hampshire. It's about 214 square miles. And what we did was two things. We looked at how future climate was going to change. Uh, we looked at output from a whole bunch of different models and we said the biggest precipitation event, the, the design storm uh, that most engineers use now for coastal New Hampshire is a design storm is the 100 year storm. That how much rain will a 100 year storm drop in a 24 hour period? And that used to be 6.3 inches. It's 8.5 inches today. And our model suggested that the highest number would be 11.4 inches in the future. So we took that change in climate, and then we also built out the watershed. So this is how historically residential development has occurred. 
So that's up to 2006. Well, we sort of plotted an exponential curve through that in terms of residential development. So close to 50% of the watershed is developed. And then uh, we did the same with significant commercial and industrial growth. Do we know this is going to happen? Absolutely not. It's a plausible storyline. You can compare it today as the best case scenario to out there as almost the worst case scenario. And then we redrew the 100 year floodplain maps in the same way, we used the same uh, methodology that FEMA now uses to draw these floodplain maps. It's hard to see, but we developed a set of these maps for all the communities. Uh, the old uh, floodplain map, actually, it's hard to see, but it's here in blue, shaded. The pink is what it is. So this is the legal floodplain map. The pink represents actual floodplain today, and the orange represents what it would be 100 years from now. So that's not very impressive. That's hard to see. So I'm just going to summarize the results for you. When we look at the changes from the flood insurance study, which is the current legal floodplain map, to existing conditions today, about 2005, that was at the latest land use that we had, we saw that the discharge of the USGS 8 station at Packers Falls during the 100 year storm, if you've seen a river during these 100 year storms, you know that they're raging, right? So that discharge goes up, has gone up by 56% already. Uh, the water surface elevation has gone up 2.7 feet, so it's going over the bridges now. And the 100 year floodplain area increased by 20%. If you start thinking about where we like to build our houses and our businesses, next to rivers, that's prime land for building, it's prime land for agriculture, and you can see we're losing 20% of it. That's already happened. And then if we look at the future, 2005 to 2100, we see an additional increase of 66% above that 56%, an additional increase in the water surface elevation of 4.4 feet, so it's going to go up 4.4 plus the 2.7, right? 7.1 7 uh, feet, an additional loss in floodplain area of 14%. Uh, what we, our, our message to the communities is, you need to begin planning for this. What are you going to do if you put a whole bunch of buildings in these areas and they all fail? So maybe that's been okay in the past because we didn't know, but now we know, so let's figure out how to solve this problem and not make our communities more vulnerable, but make our communities more resilient. This is not easy. That land is worth a lot of money. There could be a lot of profit that's lost by not building on this land in the short term. There's a lot of money that can be saved and probably lives saved in the long term if we actually think about how it is we're going to deal with this problem moving forward. Um, you can imagine, uh, you know, I, I might get depressed thinking about a lot of this information. <laughs> so small victories are, are wonderful and so on the page 7 or page 8 of the application for an alteration of terrain permit in New Hampshire, they have actually changed this checkbox. So it used to say rainfall amount obtained from the north, not from, it used to, be, it used to say TP40, technical paper 40, which was the NOAA official publication for the 24 hour, 100 year design storm, which is really old and ended with uh, using data in 1963, but what most engineers use to say actually go to this new Cornell precipitation atlas and that's where the new 8.5 inches of uh, the design storm actually comes from. So if there's one thing you walk away from tonight, if you're involved in any kind of infrastructure development, please make sure that the engineers at least do the designs based around the Cornell Atlas and not just TP40. They'll be impressed that you actually know both of those names. Um, uh, but uh, as a result of our study and other studies, uh, New Hampshire DES actually changed its permit process. Uh, which uh, we hope will actually uh, save us uh, a lot of money and, and suffering in the future. All right, so more precipitation, it means we're going to have more water all the time, right? Not so true. So because our summers warm up and summer precipitation doesn't go up much, it turns out that not only are we going to get more floods, but we're going to get more drought. So if you just focus on the left-hand column there, um, the one that's on top of the one to three months, so the top figure, uh, you can't see it, but it says uh, 1961 to 1999. That's the frequency of drought in a 30-year period. And those lime greens sort of <coughs> represent about 15, 10 to 15 droughts in a 30-year period, right? Typically, New England suffers a drought, short-term drought, in summertime, once every three to four years. Right? We haven't really had a significant drought recently. Under the high emission scenario, by the end of the century, you can see that almost all of New England is pink. 
That means we're having 30 droughts in a 30 year period. And this actually, the, the, the way that we figured this out was we actually modeled soil moisture. So it's inputs of precipitation minus outputs via evaporation. So it's a very sophisticated study. Uh, 30 droughts in a 30 year period under the high emission scenarios, that's a drought every summer, which I would argue New England is not at all prepared for. Under the low emission scenario, we can see a slight increase in the frequency of drought, but one that we could probably adapt to certainly much more easily. Our forests are also uh, going to be changing. We have predominantly a maple beech birch forest. Just You guys are probably in the, in the height of your uh, colors with maple leaves down here. No? Yes? Yeah. Uh, I was just up north this weekend and all the leaves are gone up there. Uh, and then the north country actually is dominated by a spruce fir forest. Um, our forests, in terms of recreation and forest products, at least when we did this study, accounted for $19 billion annually. It's a lot of, big part of our economy, especially as you get uh, farther north in the region. Under the high emission scenario, we would expect a climate that would no longer support a spruce fir forest anywhere in New England. And most of our maple beech birch forests would be isolated to the northern parts of the region and replaced with an oak hickory forest. So that's this image down here. And under lower emissions, we retain most of our maple beech birch forest, but still lose the spruce fir forest. Um, I don't know if there's a lot we can do uh, to prepare for that, uh, but I would argue that we really don't want to lose our maple beech birch forest. So let's figure out how we get on a low emissions pathway. In addition, if you uh, haven't been paying attention, but I bet you have here in Newburyport, there's this new pest that's arrived called the hemlock woolly adelgid, that when it gets on hemlock trees, it literally sucks, sucks the life force out of them, and hemlock trees die in three to four years. So it turns out that their, their uh, geographic spread is limited by one really cold winter night. Minus 18 degrees centigrade will kill them all off. We're, getting, we're not getting those cold winter nights as, as uh, frequently. And so uh, by the end of the century, we especially see a lot of warming and minimum temperatures in winter. We would expect hemlock woolly adelgid to infest, in fact, all of the forests across the Northeast, which would have a significant impact on our hemlock forests. And, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid isn't the only pest we have to worry about. They're not all linked directly to climate change, but warmer climates seem to be helping in equine tick disease and equine uh, triple E and um, West Nile virus. So, uh, uh, you know, one of the big unintended consequences are what pests are going to have to deal with in the future that we haven't had to deal with in the past. And then, uh, 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 not last, uh, another uh, big, big thing we looked at in this um, Northeast Climate Impact Assessment was marine uh, resources, and we looked at the potential loss of the commercial cod fishery, which some of my fishing colleagues would say we've already lost. They've certainly lost it in Canada. But what we see here is that the uh, thermal um, young juvenile cod need cold bottom temperatures in order to survive. So currently the thermal habitat for juvenile cod exists in the Gulf of Maine, but not in the Mid-Atlantic Bight. Mid-Atlantic Bight still has cod, just no juvenile cod. But by the end of the century under higher emissions, we don't see thermal habitat existing for young cod anywhere in the Gulf of Maine. And therefore uh, we would expect the entire collapse of the cod fishery. Uh, sort of to, you know, layer it on top of, of uh, uh, 400 years of uh, extracting resources from the Gulf of Maine as well. And then one of, one of my favorite pastimes, uh, skiing, uh, we looked at this, uh, we really sort of, uh, we took a lopsided approach to this. We said, uh, first of all, we said if ski areas are going to remain viable, they should be open for 100 days a year, which is a pretty good rule of thumb, and 70% of the time they should be open at Christmas. And then we allowed the ski areas in our model to make as much snow as they wanted. So there was no restriction, financial or water resources, on the amount of snow that they could make. The only restriction was it had to be cold enough. Right? They're getting pretty good. They, they can make snow almost right up to 32, maybe sometimes 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then we went out and looked at temperatures by the end of the century. We modeled this ski area by ski area. So north facing slopes, you know, survive a little bit better. But the only area that remains, remains viable for skiing at the end of the century is the mountains in western Maine, which means they, they meet both of those criteria. Everywhere else is either vulnerable or highly vulnerable, and the impacts are certainly much larger on um, uh, snowmobiles as a recreation, because you just can't make snow for thousands and thousands of miles. 
So they suffer even more dramatically, which really you think is would be you know represents the collapse of uh, winter recreation, at least uh, commercial support for winter recreation across the region. Here's last but not least uh, sea level rise, which I'm sure you all in Newburyport are paying attention to in Newbury. Um, when you look at that curve, I hope you see that there's a lot of uncertainty in the future of sea level rise. Uh, right? So here's how it's risen so far, global sea level rise. Uh, this is from a paper by the Rear and Ramsdorf. There's about four or five papers in and they have sort of similar levels of projected sea level rise. Uh, this was the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimated sea level rise from their fourth assessment report back in 2007. And the fifth assessment report is now up in, in that range, the report that just came out. But you'll see by the middle of the century, something on the range of one to two feet of sea level rise. By the end of the century, two and a half to six, two and a half to seven feet of sea level rise. So if you're a policymaker and you've got to make a decision, or let's say you're the admiral of the Navy and you have to make a decision, or you're head of the Army Corps of Engineers and you've got a whole bunch of infrastructure, that's at sea level and you have to make a decision. This is a little disconcerting. Like, you scientists, can't you get your act together and figure out how much more, how, can't you narrow the bands and tell me actually how much sea level rise is going to happen? So it turns out we can't because we don't know what's going to happen with Greenland and Antarctica. West Antarctica in particular and Greenland have started changing their behavior and they've doubled the amount of ice that they're dumping into the ocean. There are these huge glaciers that drain the ice sheets, just like rivers. They move much faster than the rest of the ice sheets, have doubled their velocity over the course of the last 15 years. In large part because they're probably lubricated at the bottom, but also because sea surface temperatures are warming up and melting the ice shelves. So we don't know if that's going to speed up, stay the same, or slow down. We don't have good models to tell the public decision makers what's going to happen. And as a result, there's a huge range on how much sea level is going to rise. What's interesting is that over the course of the past 10 to 15 years, the range has never got lower. <laughs> right? The bottom part of the range increases a little bit, and the top part of the range increases a lot. So the message here is, sure there's uncertainty, but it's not going to be any less than a foot by the middle of the century, and it's not going to be any less than a couple of feet by the end of the century. So time to start preparing for that. Right? We do not have the money to protect all of the eastern seaboard from two feet of sea level rise in the next year. But we don't have to. We've got time to see actually what's going to happen with sea level rise as long as we begin to lay the foundation for how we think about dealing with sea level rise. And my, uh, my colleague Paul Kirshen, who works on coastal infrastructure, will say there's really th three things you can do. You can protect it by putting up big seawalls, but they have their own challenges that you know about here in Newburyport. Uh, you can uh, adapt, you can change your structure so you can adapt with higher sea levels, so you can put your building on big posts. For example, you can have a bottom foundation that knocks out but doesn't knock your house down. Or you can retreat. Or you can do a fourth thing, which is do nothing and stick your head in the sand and hope something that oh, sea levels aren't going to rise, which isn't going to happen. And those are not easy decisions, right? Because these are people's homes that they've had for a long time. But it's a reality of the future, and how much longer can taxpayers keep paying for people to rebuild their house, houses in these areas? It's going to be a really tough discussion. I would suggest probably nowhere tougher than right here in this community. Um, but this is, you have to start preparing for one foot by the middle of the century and two feet by the end of the century. And, uh, and then see what develops as we get as we move along. We'll, science is going to get better at narrowing these predictions as we move forward in time. Um, uh, so yeah, that's just a sign to say you know a big part of the uncertainty is what's happening with Antarctica and Greenland. But you can see in the blue line and, and that uh, and the pink line that uh, the, the sea level contribution is just continuing to get more and more and more. All right, so I just did this to show people in, in coastal New Hampshire what, uh, what I'm talking about. Cause, ah, 11 feet, 12 feet of tidal range, what's a couple of feet of sea level rise mean? Well, the challenge is always when we have a really big storm, right? So those bars, this is actually the scale. Uh, this was probably as good for Plum Island as it is for Rye, New Hampshire. So there's a low tide to high tide, 9, 10, 11 feet tidal range. Storm surge currently in coastal New Hampshire is about um, 8 to 9 feet. You add sea level rise by 2050, of that's 1.7 feet. By 2100, 
uh, you get up to that uh, 6.3 feet. And then, you know, worst of all worlds, we have that big nor'easter that comes in on King Tide, which in coastal New Hampshire adds another couple of feet. So uh, you've now got still water coming in the second floor of somebody's house, right? So the problem is not the day-to-day -day sea level rise. Well, that has problems with it, but the big problem is when we have those big nor'easters that happen through astronomical high tide, and they end up eroding beaches and washing houses away. Uh, so just to give you a sense of uh, the potential future, uh, uh, this is probably applicable here uh, for Newburyport. But here's our 100-year flood height as measured in uh, the Piscataqua River at our tidal gauge that we have up there. That's the current 100-year flood, 6.8 feet above high tide. If you add sea level rise at 2100 and king tide under higher sea level, right, that could be as high as 15.3 feet. So we're looking at more than a doubling of what the existing 100-year storm surge height is. So the maps I'm about to show you uh, are for 12 feet above mean high, high water. All these numbers are for mean, above mean high, high uh, water, which is sort of the average of the highest daily tide. So the maps I'm showing you are not the worst case scenario by a long stretch. Uh, and I picked one, I haven't done these for Newberry uh, Port or Plum Island. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, I think, to, uh, to pursue them because they're very illustrative. Uh, you might recognize this, so Seabrook and Hampton, uh, the Seabrook Hampton Estuary in back there, you can see uh, the nuclear power plant right back in there. And so uh, we've done these a little differently, and what I'm plotting here is if there's a, a storm that results of an increase in sea level, 12 feet above mean high, high water. If you're in yellow here, that means the depth of water over the land is zero, the depth of water over land is zero to three feet. Uh, in the pink, it's three to six feet. So here, you start, you better get your big hip leaders, right? Three to six feet, you gotta start thinking about getting a boat. Six to nine feet in orange, right? You gotta start thinking about getting a much bigger boat. And greater than nine feet, like it's probably time to leave. So if you take a look up there at Hampton Beach, you can see that, uh, so I need a sort of a pointer. Well, you can see here, let's look at Seabrook, right? This is a really big residential area in Seabrook. Uh, it's at a big burn, like you move to Plum Island, then it goes down into a bowl and back. Right? These homes, right, on the land, there's nine feet of water. Tough to recover from, from this 100-year storm. Same at Hampton Beach, most of the businesses along the entire Hampton Beach are underwater. These are still water elevations. They don't capture the impact of any significant wave action, right? The good news here is that our nuclear power plant isn't underwater. They've built it high enough so that it should be good for a few more decades. Hopefully, I don't know what they've done with their generators, which was a problem uh, with Fukushima. But, you know, it, it, when you think about the tax dollars for Seabrook that come from this set of homes, that's along the beach, this would be devastating for the community, and I would argue would result in, I don't know how that community survives without the tax revenue from those homes. Uh, I would, it's not a very different situation for, for Plum Island. Right? That level of sea level rise is really going to put most of those homes at risk. A uh, similar uh, map that we did for uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, you're probably not uh, as familiar with the geography up there, but uh, lots of our, our downtown area that's currently being developed uh, actually go, goes under sort of uh, three to six to nine feet of water. Uh, I, there's a historian looking at this map the other day saying, wow, all that stuff that's underwater, that's where people never built in the past. <laughs> uh, but the biggest concern uh, when I look at these is that island right up there, because that's our Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, which used to be three islands, and it's now one island, which is why the Navy is all over the issue of climate change, because they've got a ton, right? Hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of infrastructure at sea level. And uh, we need to start thinking about what we're going to do uh, with our uh, naval facilities around the country. All right, so uh, where do we go from here? This is all very depressing. Uh, and yet I remain optimistic, and I would argue that uh, we are at that proverbial uh, fork in a path in the woods. And the path that we've traveled is one where we just stick our heads in the sand and continue to rely upon fossil fuels as our main source of energy. And 
I would argue that we are really at the point where we no longer have a choice to go down that pathway. We have to go down a different pathway where we invest in energy efficiency and renewable technologies and in our communities we work hard, especially with our budgets, to figure out how it is we make our communities more resilient to the new climate normal. And I think another uh, pathway is one that I've been thinking about most recently, uh, another part of the path less traveled, is really uh, what is it that we do with all of our investments? So, you know, I'm a climate scientist, I've known these problems come been going on for 25 years, but I still put my retirement fund that goes up essentially smokestacks in China, right? I put it into the stock market and it disappears and it makes me a good rate of return and I'm happy. Uh, but I'm no longer happy because what I want to do is invest that money in my community. And there's a number of different new instruments and tools that are being developed to be able to invest in your community, but also have an instrument that can spread the risk over enough investments such that you make a great rate of return. I don't know about Massachusetts, maybe you guys have some examples, but in New Hampshire we have the Community Loan Fund that is doing a superb job uh, at these investments. You give your money to the Community Loan Fund, they invest it, they do great community work with it, and their default rate is less than what the big banks is. And so, uh, because transitioning uh, to be more energy secure and to be more weather resilient is going to take an upfront investment, I think we have to figure out a way that we don't look to our federal government to do this, because I'm daily losing some faith in my federal government, uh, especially to, to think about addressing big issues uh, like this at a community scale. Uh, I think we're still going to be funding our military, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, but, you know, where are we going to get the money to protect our communities? And I think we need to figure out how we invest in our communities and have those communities provide us with a rate of return on our investment. And I'm not an investment specialist, but I actually see this as the major barrier. We need to get that community money on the street to help make homes more energy efficient and to help communities adapt now so that we can save money in the future. So we'll just finish up with a couple of examples. Uh, a lot of my examples are from New Hampshire. You guys have a great climate action plan in Massachusetts. You actually have a law that codified that climate action plan and those uh, uh, greenhouse gases and reductions into law. You're really leading the nation in that way. But really, it's pretty. climate action plans are pretty straightforward. You've got to make your buildings more energy efficient. You've got to do renewable energy generation. You've got to protect your natural resources. Right? You don't want to go and cut down all your trees for energy. If, and if you do want to cut them down for timber and some energy, you got to make sure you don't pave that land over. You got to let those trees regrow. We got to expand our agricultural production to uh, improve our um, our food security. Uh, we need government action should lead, and we actually have to figure out at a community level, which you guys are grappling with, is how we adapt uh, to the future. Um, and so I think I'll just finish up a couple more slides here. Uh, this is true for Massachusetts. I put the New Hampshire slide up here. We're actually doing the right thing. We're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions while we're growing our gross state product. Now you could argue that's not the best measure. It's just an easy measure and one uh, that's easy to get. But this, this separation of greenhouse gases and gross state product is exactly what we have to do. We're going to use energy. We need energy. You can't run our economy or support our quality of life without energy. We just have to get it without burning greenhouse gases. So you're going to increase the gross state product while you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. That's exactly what we need to continue doing. And New England is sort of, New England and California are really leading the nation in this respect. So we're already doing it, we just have to do it better. Per capita emissions of greenhouse gases, you can see Massachusetts is doing pretty well there. Uh, New Hampshire is not far behind. Given the amount of money, we, we spend a lot less money per capita than Massachusetts does, but we're doing pretty well. Uh, and try to keep up, but you guys again are, are leading the nation in a number of different aspects. So I'll stop there. Your, this PowerPoint will be available to you. All of the resources that I talked about, the images I showed, is in one of those references up there. If you really want to dig into the climate science, you can check out these papers. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.
questions about the frequency of, of how can you have droughts and floods at the same time. And essentially, the droughts are always going to come in the summertime. And the floods are going to come in the other seasons. So think about our big floods, right? They don't occur in summertime because actually, actually the ecosystem suck up all that water anyway. So March 2010, uh, that was the spring. Uh, so March, uh, early spring, rain on, uh, on frozen ground. Uh, the uh, 06 and 07 events, both uh, April and May. Um, you know, the worst case, uh, which we can't even model, is that uh, we're gonna, precipitation in winter is going to go up, as well as the, the uh, shoulder seasons. But if we get an increase in winter precipitation, which we project, it's going to be warmer, so it's going to occur as rain. But there's no snow on the ground, and it's still cold enough for the ground to freeze. That would be the worst case, is that we have frozen ground, no snow cover, and a really big precipitation event, which is sort of what happened in March 2010. So, uh, yeah, droughts in summer, floods other time of the year. It's like it, it's it's like the definition of hell squared or something. Well, won't that have a bigger impact than like you're showing a change in the forest? I mean, that, that in and of itself, the big cycle like that, I would imagine, has a big impact on all the wildlife. So, yeah, it's huge changes in ecosystems and wildlife, but I don't think that's going to have a big driver on on flooding, especially if we're if we're getting rid of more of those ecosystems, and you know the impacts on wildlife. That's just that's that's tough. Wildlife. If you think climate's tough to model, wildlife dynamics. You know, like just the dynamics of Lyme, Lyme tick disease are are really difficult. But yes, yeah, so, so there's I mean, there's certainly going to be some some uh, unknown consequences of what's going on. But I, I think for the the flood story, we've got it pretty well nailed down. Um, in that, especially if we continue to, to pave the watersheds, they'll be, they'll be much worse. But yeah, droughts and floods increasing in frequency every year. Given where we are right now, where we sit right now, 100 years from now, this building won't be here, no matter what. Uh, I would say that's a reasonable conclusion, yes. And the Audubon, and most of the Plum Island uh, I mean, when it's, when it's not flooded, I, there'll be a beautiful estuary here. And but the sea level has risen poorly. Yeah, there's, there's nowhere really for that. I don't know the geography here. Uh, I know we, we've talking, when we were talking to Seabrook Hampton, Hampton Falls, <coughs> we've talked a lot about one of their uh, adaptation measures will be to uh, wherever they can not develop land that's close to the salt marsh so the salt marsh can move. Like that feeling is that here there's not a lot of places for it to move. So, uh, so I mean it would, there's some areas where I think it could move inland, that, you know, I drive along the route one. Um, so it's going to migrate, and where it has a place to migrate, it will migrate to, where it doesn't have a place to migrate, those places that are hard will be more at risk. Yeah. So you're saying the salt marsh if, if there's right. place for the salt marsh to move in, yeah, and, and it's been moving. I mean, there was no salt marsh here 15,000 years ago, right? It's a recent phenomenon of, of sea level, which rose from 18,000 uh, to 10,000 years ago, it rose 400 feet. So they're, they're a sort of a, a, a modern creation. Somebody's waving at me in the back there. Yeah, hi. Uh, in the current situation with FEMA, before the new regulations came out, I believe that the uh, in a flood zone or something, that elevations of new structures had to be 12 feet plus a foot above mean flood elevation. 12 feet is, is would you consider mean flood elevation? Well, so, it, 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 so I need the details. I mean, talking about fresh water or ocean flooding ocean, and ocean. talking about above any, uh, the vertical data or about mean high, high water. So it's, I, I mean, it's, it's, it, it changes depending on where you are. But, but 12 feet above uh, the North American vertical beta sounds about right for coastal flooding where we are now. Yeah, I think they have a foot to that as well. Well, Massachusetts would have. FEMA hasn't. Okay. Or, or maybe if they draw new maps, they've done it. But we FEMA's got a challenge because they, they refuse to look in the future. We have a controversial project being proposed for the Newburyport waterfront right now. Commercial, uh, residential, uh, project 70,000 square feet uh, within the what's called Commonwealth Tidelands 
the tide historically flowed right up against uh, Water Street. Uh, there's a law called Chapter 91 in Massachusetts. For the use of tide lands, you have to get a special license or a permit. And that the current laws, regulations say that you have to take into consideration three foot sea, le sea level rise over the lifetime of the project which they estimate to be 75 years for a typical project. Um, what, are the, what would the implications of having to raise uh, the base elevation of a structure by those three feet? Do, do, do you have any? Is it currently that the people who are proposing the project are ignoring this particular fact? Uh, so you, you can't let them ignore it. Well, we're, you hoping, have to. we're hoping to. Yeah, but you forced just them can't. to recognize right. it, but they're unwilling to recognize it and are putting off recognizing it until after they make a decision about uh, granting someone permission to do it. Right, so forcing them is a social problem, and so uh, I can't, I, I'm a but it's scientist. Just, <laughs> but, but, the, but the ramifications are, uh, I would say, significant for the cost of that structure to actually uh, raise it three feet. Uh, but there's plenty of examples, especially if you go to Germany and the Netherlands, of uh, companies that have done exactly that. They have actually the bo their bottom, they have street levels that are essentially a level above the street, and their bottom floors are for parking. They don't build swimming pools <laughs> to put their parking in. The bottom is for parking so you can move all those cars, etc. And then they have their, where they walk actually, and their terraces, etc., one, one story up. Um, and so there's plenty of examples, and uh, I, have a, I have a friend in Portsmouth who called me up six years ago. I said, Cam, I'm building a new house. What should I do? I said, raise it three feet above the height that anybody tells you to do it. And he did, and he, put, he didn't put any of his um, uh, heating uh, or air conditioning in the, in the basement. He put it on the first floor or the second floor. They just built a hospital in Boston that did the same thing. So short term, it's going to, the ramifications are it's going to cost more. Long term... Uh, it's going to end up making that facility have a much longer lifetime. Well, and so if I, if I, you know, so this is, I, I'm going to give you some social advice from a scientist, so just take it for what it is. Uh, but I would really be asking the question, who's paying the insurance, who's, who's paying for the insurance on this building? And I would, I would wrestle a guarantee from them that not a cent of taxpayer money goes in to insuring that property uh, year to year, or for rebuilding it when it gets destroyed. We cannot continue to, pu to push public money into private buildings, which is, the, the National Flood Insurance Program is bankrupt. Yeah. It's bankrupt by billions of dollars. And so now we're changing the floodplains, and it's going to cost people a lot more for flood insurance. And families are not going to be able to live there. It's already happening in uh, New Jersey and New York. I heard some examples from up here uh, on Plum Island. Uh, but if, if you can't get them to, to, to be aware, just ask about the insurance question and say that you're not going to bail them in. It's your building, you take care of it. Don't, come, don't ever come back to us and ask for money to fix it. At some point, you need to get them to understand that uh, it's in their best interest to actually take into account sea level rise. And uh, so I'll tell you, this is getting me going on social stuff. <laughs> You know, i got to tell you, the people that resist the issue of climate change the most seem to me to be people who have made lots of money in their lives and think they're just, they know it all. They're in charge. I get told about climate science all the time by wealthy individuals. It's like, I, I study this stuff. I studied it for 25 years. You really, it's, I, I can't emphasize enough, you have to get through, especially to developers. And if you can, if you can convince them that they're going to make more money if they pay attention, that's the corner that we have to turn. On top of that, we're talking about underground parking. <laughs> Just start calling it an underground Sorry. swimming pool. Sorry. Just start referring to it as the big day. That's a really expensive swimming pool. I don't want to swim anywhere near those tiles. <laughs> yes. Sorry, the woman behind me first. She was faster to the draw. So we got a positive. Some days. <laughs> well, putting it back for all this. Um, what are some of the clean energy technologies or projects or initiatives that you see locally in New England that, that you know, you're talking about investment and things like that? I'm not so about specific companies, but what, what's some of the stuff that you get excited about that? So, uh, really, it's all of the 
the above. You can't really solve it with any one technology, so it's all the technologies. Uh, but the one that is the biggest and the most effective is actually energy efficiency. We, in Germany, they use half the amount of energy we use, and they, they have a similar quality of life and economy. So, uh, I don't know about Massachusetts, but New Hampshire, we have half a million homes, and about half a million of them are energy inefficient. So, we got to renovate those, and that's a great workforce development program. We just got to get on and do it. Uh, and then, certainly, wind has, uh, there's wonderful opportunities for wind. We have to solve the problem on where to site it, so we don't have all these not in my backyard fights. But we have to come out in a, in a big, open, messy public discussion and say, this is where wind's going to go. Where is that going to be? I'm not the person that's going to dictate it, but Maine is investing in a huge way in offshore floating wind. Huge amount of money going in to develop that technology, and there is no shortage of energy. They're talking about powering New England with offshore wind in Maine in the future. Uh, so uh, winds, good. solar, there should not be a building in New England that doesn't have solar hot water. Nine months of the year, we can generate most of the hot water we need. It's cost-effective, it pays for itself in four to five years. We should just be doing that. And then frankly, uh, photovoltaics uh, work. We just have to have better net metering laws so that uh, uh, whenever we we're putting it into the grid, we're getting out of wholesale and get a retail price for that, which means it gets subtracted from our bill at par for when we're using energy. So it's not gonna solve all our problems, but again, Germany, not a sunny place, right? Solar leader. Um, uh, Clearly, we have biomass across New England. Uh, I don't think we should cut down all our forests, but we shouldn't be using those forests to generate energy that's really uh, electricity that's a very inefficient process. So 25% efficiency when you take wood chips and burn them for electricity. 70 to 80% when you burn that as heat in your home. Better than that if you have a wood pellet stove. So wood for uh, thermal heating or district wood heating, that makes, that makes sense. And then the big technology leap there is we might be able to get uh, cellulosic ethanol. So much, we have to get the bacteria right, we have to figure out how to do this, but how do we get liquid fuel out of our trees? Uh, geothermal, lots of opportunity for geothermal across uh, the Northeast. It's expensive to retrofit with new buildings, we should be doing it. And then sort of on the cusp, not quite there, if I had a lot of money to invest, like billions of dollars, I would be investing in ocean energy, tidal and wave energy. We've been talking about it for 20 years, but you know, we're not going to be doing big algae ponds in New England. They're going to be happening in California and Arizona. But, uh, but ocean energy, I mean, you've all stood out there on that ocean and seen the energy, right? There's a lot of energy. We just haven't figured out how to harness it. Did I miss any? That was, that's pretty good. You should have been going down in the, uh, um, whatever it was.
so um, uh, on one point, uh, so we don't use the word mitigate for both in the climate work. So we use mitigation as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation is responding to climate change. Except FEMA uses the word mitigation for adapting to climate change. But I'll stick to the adaptation and mitigation separation. Um, so with that said, the most effective adaptation strategy is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To reduce the amount of change that we need to adapt to so that we adapt to two feet of sea level rise instead of six feet of sea level rise. So then the question is, if that's the most, if you agree with that premise, then why act locally when it's a, a global issue? So uh, the real reason to act locally, I'd agree with you, is that uh, actually you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because the way we get there is how we become more energy secure. So we are not sort of uh, at the beck and call of global energy markets. We should think of it being independent Yankees with the energy that we produce, and that's going to be really good for our economy. Uh, right, well, it's a different reason, but it solves the same problem. So, so the, the second part of that is, we know that most of the carbon in the atmosphere comes from the developing world. That carbon morally belongs to the developed world. It's not the developing world that has put it there. The problem we are in today is because of the developed world. The problem 50 years from now is going to be that of the developing world. So I would say we're morally obliged to act. And as a result of that, we know that China and India will not act unless the United States acts. Europe has taken a leadership role, the United States has not, and so China will continue to drag its feet, as will India, Brazil, and Indonesia after it, if the US does not show some leadership on this issue. That, I am certain of it. So, why not, why can't New England, well, and California, be the leaders of this country? So, the reason we do it is because we figure out how to do it, and then we help the developing world develop on a pathway that is fundamentally different from the pathway we develop them. So that's, that's, that's how I feel you solve the problem, is that actually the US is in this critical role. And the other piece is that I just don't buy this, well, if we don't do it, other, you know, if you know, India is the problem. Since when has the United States looked at a serious global problem and said, yeah, we don't want to lead on that place? Right? We pride ourselves on being a global leader, so why not lead on this issue? It, I, I do not understand why we don't take that position. Now, uh, the other part of your question is an individual living on Plum Island. I think there's a point there, because I think in the not too distant future, those houses are going to be there. So uh, I would invest in, frankly, I would invest in a property somewhere else. <laughs> and I, and, and I'm, I'm, act, I'm not, I understand that's difficult, and I'm not trying to be funny. But if I was sitting down with my family and I had a place on Plum Island, I would say, who can I sell this to tomorrow? Or can I afford to just accept that it's going to be washed away at some point in time and I will no longer have it and where will I go to live? And I would not be putting a bunch of solar panels on it or fixing it up. I would be figuring out a way that my family could afford Another problem you're going to and, and I don't have that problem, so maybe that's easy for me to say. I know that that comes with some, some that a lot of pain for a lot of people. Another problem that you may run into is that you may uh, retrofit your home, but if your neighbor and the town doesn't uh, also raise the streets, you're going to be sitting uh, in a house that may be out in the water. So absolutely. So you have to make that consideration of do you want to spend a bunch of money on a house that is likely going to flood in the future? And, and that's another tough, tough decision, and I would say you probably don't. You certainly don't want to move to Florida either. <laughs> Rent. I tell, my, I tell my students, I say, do not let your parents buy anything in Florida. Rent it, enjoy it while it's there. But, but they, they're, you know, they don't have any elevation. The scariest thing that you said here tonight for me was the inertia that the temperature rise has developed. That it's going to be 80 to 90 years or so before we see a change, pretty much despite what we do. About 40 to 50 years. 40, oh, 40 yeah, to 50 years. Yeah, the middle of the century, we begin to see that bifurcation. It right? looked pretty tight at the end of that far. Because I mean, we have enough trouble getting a mindset and following through. We 
receive results. But to have two to three generations of doing this and not seeing any results, that's going to take a, that's going to be a pretty hefty visit. Yeah. That's going to be, and uh, I don't know about other countries, this country's not very good at it. No, this, and, and that's I, amazing. I, I, I had never realized that, that, that the lag time was, was that large. And, and so there's a huge social and cultural challenge in a, in a society that really looks to the immediate gratification. Uh, and we're not talking quarterly profits here, right? We're talking about two to three generations in. I think it's, it's one of the reasons that we haven't been able to deal with this problem. I think secondly, it's been pretty easy for those who stand to benefit from the status quo Big energy companies, uh, for a while the auto companies, but not anymore, have been able to, to bend move the American public. They've had a hundred million dollar plus marketing campaign saying, you're really good the way you are. Your life's fine. Don't worry about those guys talking about climate change. It's way easier to sell you're okay the way it is than you need to change. Uh, the flip side, I would say, is that you know climate scientists are really not good marketers. Right? We, so we're, we've been starting sort of 20 years uh, behind. And it's not really our job to market. It's our job to sort of you know, tell the truth as, as best we understand it. Um, but it is one of the, the, the cruxes of the problem. And the one place, uh, the two places actually, that I think that people think really long term are their children's education and uh, insurance that they buy. And so I think those, for me, are the two examples I can bring up. And say, this is a bit of investment in the future. It's not about us. And in fact, our generation, I think I can say that, uh, it, we have, I, I would say we have completely failed our children and grandchildren. We have kicked the can down the road, essentially so that we could have a better quality of life. And we really, we really, the way we act suggests that we don't really care that much about their collective future. We obviously care about our kids and our grandkids and their individual future, but collectively we're not acting like we care about. Just wondering, as a climate scientist, what do you think about nuclear energy and, and uh, natural gas? So, uh, uh, nuclear, I, I, there's certainly several climate scientists, James Hansen among the most prominent, who said, we got to get going on nuclear. It's the only way we can solve this problem because I don't see humans changing their behavior. Uh, and, uh, you know, he argues that there's a whole new set of uh, nuclear power plants that are coming out that are much smaller and much safer. So, I'm not a nuclear scientist, so I don't know. But certainly the current system, I think we cannot go down that path like it has. Uh, not only because of the fact that there's problems with, with the nuclear power plants as they are just with tsunamis and tidal waves, uh, but certainly there's a whole uh, terrorist aspect to it. But the most concerning for me comes back to, because I, I actually study this, and it's the economics of it, right? Just like you can't, you, you have to get our flood insurance from the federal government, right? Nuclear power plants cannot pay the insurance. That insurance is paid by you and me. And therefore, it's an economic model that is not sustainable unless we want to keep holding the bill. So I am, I, I come from Canada. I'm a, actually a social democrat, right? You can call me socialist and I don't get upset about it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm becoming more and more of a libertarian uh, in that uh, I, think, I don't think there should be subsidies for energy. Like, let's just open it up Get rid of the subsidies for big oil and big gas, and let's just see who wins. Uh, because we have subsidized nuclear. I mean, when I was a kid, you remember this? Energy will be too cheap to meter. <laughs> right? Not so much. Um, and so, and so I, don't, I don't think nuclear, uh, as it is today, it is an answer. If we can come up with something that's much safer, and therefore plants that can insure themselves, and and you know, deal with this whole terrorist threat of the waste, maybe, but not as it stands now. What are we doing for you? We all, we I think we have time question? for one more, and it has to be quick. Okay. Wow. It's tough. I don't know. Who's, who's got it? You guys fight amongst yourselves. <laughs> you, you have one already. I have one. All right. So I, my question is that um, one of the things we have a lot of discussion about here is um, mitigation strategies like CWAP and heat scraping and things like that. And they cost money. They have been for the moment. What's your take on those things? It's, it's, a, it's, 
as, as you have seen with your own eyes, it's a very short-term solution. And when you're desperate, you will certainly invest in short-term solutions. So I, I think at least a part of the conversation is, so what are we going to do this year? But what are we going to do 10 years from now? What are we going to do 20 years from now? What are we going to do 30 years from now? That needs to be part of every discussion that a family has, that a community has, that the state has, and that the nation has. What does climate change mean for this decision? And I don't have all the answers, but we need to start having the adult conversation. And not say, you know, wow, we don't have to worry about it. We have to worry about it. And if we start now, we, there's, there's enough sort of money in the public realm that we can begin to do things over the long term that will build community resilience. And they're going to be difficult decisions, but we have that, those, those financial resources over decades. We don't have them in one year. So that's why we have to plan. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Cameron Wake. Good luck with all your work going forward.